So we are in that book of James, and we are continuing on in, our, in the series of James, and we are in James 1, and we're going to finish that chapter today. It seems like we're taking a long time, but James is just a couple chapters long. It's not that, that big of a book. And so I would invite us this morning to stand uh, as you hear the reading of God's Word together in James chapter 1. We'll go from verse 19 to the end this morning. James 19, or James 1, 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It's the word of the Lord. Have a seat. So if you didn't hear the beginning and you were online, you heard the word of God, which is the most important thing. The rest of it is just kind of bonus content uh, in a way. The word is what truly matters. Now, there is a word, speaking of word, in this passage that seems to keep coming up. And it's not the first time we've, we've heard that word. And before we dig too far into what we've read just now, we want to kind of address that word. And that's the word deceive here. It shows up in verse 22, right? And as a matter of fact, it, it comes around again in the same passage in verse 26. And if you go, well, that sounds familiar. That's because last week, when you look at verse 16, uh, you know, James actually opens that section in the same way. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. James seems to use the word deceived a lot in this chapter. Why is James wanting to sound and talk about deception so much? And I think James is obviously very worried in some way about deception. But what does he mean when he says deception? Right? The deception he's talking about is not just some earthly fooling, somebody being fooled by a, a fellow neighbor around, but a cosmic waging war. James is concerned about the deception that we experience from Satan, the enemy in a very real and direct way. And I think we oftentimes go through our daily life paying little to no mind to Satan's active deception in our lives. Do you know that right now, even as you're sitting here trying to listen to me without falling asleep, that the enemy plots and prowls for you like a lion? Do you know that Satan is constantly thinking about every single facet of your unique individual life? That everything you do or think or say or experience, Satan's paying attention to it and plotting and prodding and thinking of ways that he can deceive you. Do you know that he's actively playing chess with your life to try and deceive you away from the Lord every second that you walk the earth? And do you know that Satan is a far better chess player than you could ever hope or dream to be when it comes to that life? I think if we're honest with ourselves, I think we feel that we have, you know, we walk the Christian life. Sure, we understand that sin is something that we struggle with. But if we're really honest, I feel like day to day, we almost kind of feel like we have a grasp on Satan. But we don't. We forget just how good he is at what he does, right? Just think back to the interaction that, that Satan has in the garden with Eve when original sin enters, right? He doesn't come up to her and just try to talk her into eating the fruit. He, he comes in and he feeds the most strategic, subtle string of deception and lies to get her to slowly move towards that, right? If he had come to Eve and said, you should eat the tree, Right? She probably wouldn't have gone for that. But what does he do instead? Well, you know, God said to you, you can't eat of any of the trees. 
It's just like a small little change in the, in the language. She says, well, not any of the trees. He says, we shouldn't, even, we shouldn't eat from that one or even touch it. It's funny, God doesn't even really say that second part, but she's already kind of been warped about what the actual truth of God's command and proclamation is. And then he, he kind of starts to tell her little things of, you know, God, you're not going to die. You know, God, God just, he really doesn't want anyone else to be like him. And what he knows that you don't know, that I know, is like, if you eat it, you'll, you'll, you'll get all the knowledge of good and evil. That's why it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he just doesn't want you to, to be like him or have what he has or possess the power that he does. He's trying to hold you down. Right? And so when she heard that and looked at the fruit and saw how pleasant it looked, right? you see the masterful deception that Satan uses. Don't think for a second unless you want to be naive in your faith, that the enemy doesn't do that to you every minute of every hour of every day of your life. Right? This is what James understands. Satan, Satan comes and prowls like a lion. And he plants these little lies about God in our heads. He gets you to doubt that God could love you. You. That God would want to give his son to save you? Why would he do that? Have you seen yourself? Do you, do you remember the thing that you did last year? How could God love that? I mean, he's, he's perfect. You're not perfect. You're kind of dirty. Right? If the people in the church that you attend knew the thing you'd done, none of them would talk to you again. So what makes you think God would want to talk to you again? Right? That's the kind of stuff that he does. He gets you to think that the choices you make make you beyond saving. He gets you to question God's goodness whenever there's a hard circumstance. Right? He plants those lies, and then when life hits us hard, he goes, see, God can't love you. Look at all the stuff that's happening. I mean, he's all powerful. If he really loved you, don't you think that life would be a little easier? He doesn't love you. The only person to love you is yourself. You see, the subtle lies that Satan plans. Some of you are hearing me talk and you're going right now, yeah, you're being deceived by me and I'm actually being ironic when I say all these things, right? Because we know the truth is far from that, but the deception of the enemy is so good, you can't even begin to fathom just how powerful Satan is at trying to sway you away from the truth. And so James, when he talks about these, these deceptions, He's talking about something cosmic and bigger than you could ever ask or imagine. And as you read letter by letter the words of James, what he's trying to do is to convince you otherwise. One of the things we're going to do as we get closer to, to summer here at Still Press this year is we're going to do a book study on the, the book of the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Um, if you've never read that book, it's, it's one of my like, top top probably three impactful books outside of the Bible itself, and that includes commentaries about the Bible, right? What, what it does is C.S. Lewis has these fictional letters that are written between an a understudy new intern demon and a seasoned senior tempter, and it's, it's these letters about how this understudy has been assigned to the, to the first human to try to tempt away from the Lord, and they're writing back and forth kind of advice and, on how you do it, and no, don't go at him this way, it'll never work, you've got to be more subtle, and, and so you're reading these letters. And, and every, every time I read the book, I'll finish a letter and I'll go, oh, enemy does that to me. Right? It's a real punch in the face when you read it because you start to think, wow. Like, and this isn't even the, the scratching of the surface of the creativity that the enemy has. This is just what one man who's a brilliant writer could kind of make up in his head of what Satan might be thinking and doing. Right? We're going to dig into that this summer and, and try to think of like, well, what are the subtle ways that the enemy tries to lead us away from the Lord. And how do we work to combat against those things? And by the way, the same goal of C.S. Lewis in writing that work is the goal that James has when he writes this first chapter. Right? So here, James' writing is motivated by the reality that Satan is trying to deceive. And he wants to make sure that we as Christians are equipped with everything we need with every good thing, good knowledge that we need to have to be able to combat that. And so James begins by telling the reader to be, what? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And this is, 
I feel such a lost quality in the world today, right? This is stuff that we hear and we go, well, of course, everybody should be slow to speak, quick to listen, you know, slow to, slow to anger. Those are good qualities. This is kind of a great therapeutic message. But the reality is that we live in a world that is so far from that. Most of us are not this way. We live in a world where everybody has an opinion and everybody's quick to speak. Think of the, the conversations that you find yourselves in on a daily basis. Most of the time, and pay attention to this, it'll cause you to look like you're spacing out when you're talking to people a little bit, but that's okay. They'll forgive you. They're your friends. Right? Listen to conversations and try to pick up on how often when you're speaking does it seem like the other person is listening versus waiting for their turn to speak. As a matter of fact, when you're listening to someone else talk, this is the harder part, do that exercise. How many, how, are, you, are you trying to formulate what it is that you're going to respond before you ever let them finish their sentence? If someone's telling you a, a funny story, are you trying to think of a funnier one that relates to it that you can come back with? Right? Most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, even the calmest, most docile, gentle souls among our, our, our congregation, most of us are probably a little quicker to speak than we are to listen. Or if we're not talkers, we're quicker to think our own thoughts rather than listen and absorb what the other side is thinking or where they're coming from. Right? We also live in a world that is pretty quick to, to be angry, don't we? I don't know about you, but I feel like people are more angry than they ought to be. I know I oftentimes am more angry than I ought to be. And sure, we can joke about the fact that I have an excuse uh, two excuses, one's four and one's two years old. But, but the, the fact of the matter is, many of you, your children have been adults for many years, and do you feel like your, whatever level of frustration and impatience and anger has decreased since your children moved out of the house? Maybe, maybe not. Right? I think people will find that they just find different things to be angered by. Oh, those neighbors down the street. Three or four of you just reacted. And you're like, you have, I know exactly, you have that neighbor, right? But we like to be angry. We do it quickly, right? We, we love to do that. We love to, to be able to give our two cents, to speak before we listen, and we love to blow up in anger. If you don't think you're somebody who likes to speak before you listen, then, then I challenge you to this. The next time you are about to comment on Facebook, don't. Don't, just don't. Like, whenever you're about to type, it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter if it's political or someone's, just don't say it and then think to yourself, how hard is it for me not to say it? <laughs> like, could you go two weeks reading the things that you read, the ridiculousness that you just want to just, oh, no, and just to not? For some of you, that's easy. Some of you don't even have Facebook. Some of you are like, what is Facebook, right? But, but just, if that's you, just, just think, how hard would it be? Like, sit at your keyboard, look at the comment that you're about to type, delete it, and go, eh. And how hard is that going to be for you? Because the, the point that you want to make, it won't be made. And how will that person change if they don't make that point? How will, they, how will they know what I think about this? And how will they be corrected? They're saying wrong things online. Someone's got to fix it. It's going to be me. Right. Don't. Right. We're quick to speak and slow to listen. And we live in a world full of anger, but James warns us that that kind of an anger and yelling gets us absolutely nowhere. See, in God's kingdom, anger and yelling get you nowhere. One of the things we're, we're trying to teach our, our, our four-year-old right now is that when you yell or whine, it doesn't get you what you want. Like, we just are instantly annoyed, and it's never going to get you there, right? It's, it's give us the carrot, not the stick. And may, maybe you might actually get what you want every once in a while, right? I don't know about you, but, the, like, whining is one of my biggest pet peeves. The moment, the moment whining happens, I'm done. Like, even if I was going to give you the thing, and now I'm not going to, because whining, you know, I just didn't know, right? <laughs> James warns us that the kingdom of God works that way. Anger and yelling gets you nothing. The only thing that happens when you get angry at people or God or yell at people or God is that God probably will use that to, to humble you extremely just to teach you something about yourself. And it won't be fun. It'll be good when it's done, but it won't be fun when it's happening. 
Nothing good will come of that anger. And I think we forget how countercultural that is in the kingdom of God. We don't need anger in God's kingdom because every good gift, as we learned last week, comes from the Lord. And he gives us his goodness freely, and we don't need to shout. See, we, we so often shout and yell because in the world in which we live that is stained by sin, that's how we get what we want and need. We have to yell and, grow, and, and be the loudest person in the room, right? It's, it's the world we live in. The loudest person usually gets their way. Right? And so it's no wonder that we are, we're prone to anger in the world in which we live because if you don't every once in a while get animated and just roll over, you're going to be trampled. Well, that's not how it works in God's kingdom. God says you don't have to be angry. You don't have to advocate even for yourself in the kingdom of God. Because every good thing I have comes to you. I give it as a free gift. The things that you need from the Lord, he gives you before, you before you ask for them because he knows that you need them. And so anger becomes superfluous. It has no use in God's kingdom. And so that's why James tells us, lay it down. Don't be so quick to anger. It will set you apart in this world when you do that. He's telling us here to take a step back and worry less about talking and being angry in the world because we don't need to. You don't need to speak up all the time. You serve a God who speaks for you. And he speaks louder than ever. And when he speaks in anger, he speaks in righteous anger, not sinful anger. The very foundation of the gospel is that it allows you to just calm down a little bit and not have to say it, but instead to be able to listen more, right? But listen to who? When James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, listen to who? Listen to, to people? Is, is James's passage here about, you know, when you're in dinner with people, you should listen more than you talk? No, not at all. In no point is he talking about others. What, what he's talking about is to listen to the word of God, the promises of God, the truth of God. He says, receive with meekness and humility the implanted word of God, which can save your soul. The way that you combat the deception that the enemy first and foremost throws at you is that you bathe yourself in scripture and truth of God's word. You spend time in it. You have to combat lies with truth. It's the most basic premise of human existence. The thing that you surround yourself with is what you most believe. That's why if you're honest with yourself, who, who of married couples, who here has, your spouse has friends that you can tell when they've hung out with those friends? Because they come home and they're like, they act a little different, right? Maybe, they, maybe they're sillier than they were. You know, maybe they revert to like language that they used to use but don't anymore. You know, they're just like, you can tell that they're different around those people. They're influenced by them, right? We, we are more influenced by our surroundings than we could ever admit or imagine, right? And so when we allow the enemy to be the, the loudest voice in our life every day, we are so far more likely to believe the deceptions. The way we combat it is by tipping the scales with truth. You've got to get yourself in a position where the truth of the Lord is speaking into you, whether it's through preaching or through study or through reading on your own, through daily time in God's word. You've got to have the, the level of voice on this side drown out the lies and deceptions on this side. You can do that. The Lord equips you and empowers you and gives you his word and his truth to be able to do that, to make sure that every word of, God, of truth from the Lord speaks louder than the enemy. Right? God gives you every tool you need and every equipping that you need and every empowerment of the spirit you need to make sure that his voice is louder than Satan's. The question just is, are you going to listen to it? Are you going to pick up on it? Are you going to get into it? Are you going to open this every day and allow the truth of the Lord to wash over you so that the deception doesn't get to win out? James here is telling us that the regular hearing of God's word is absolutely paramount to Christian longevity. It's essential, right? You have to be hearers of the word because by nature of existing in this, in this earth, you are hearers of the enemy. You don't get a choice in that one. You just, you just hear it. 
Everywhere you go in life, you hear the enemy. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I don't amount to enough. God's promises aren't enough. They won't come through. He's not as good as he says he is. Those things just permeate every moment of our existence. And so the only way to combat that is by allowing the truth of Scripture to speak louder. But James, while emphasizing that we have to be hearers of the word, then takes it to the next step in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Here's that that word again, deceiving. He said it earlier, and now again, if, if, you, if, you don't, if you just hear the word, but don't do it, right? if the listening isn't accompanied by some kind of action, and we'll get into that in a second, right? then you are even then, even if you're hearing the wholeness, the whole word, all of it, but not doing it, you are still deceiving yourselves. It's not enough to stop yourself from being deceived to join every Bible study that you can ask for or imagine. It's not enough to stop yourself from being deceived to have perfect church attendance records or to watch sermons online, both ours and any others that you might come across in the course of your week. It's not enough. You also have to be doers of the word. And James then draws a a comparison to a man who sees himself in the mirror and just moves on, right? When we, in the morning, I don't know about you, I, I, in the morning, before I go anywhere, I just kind of take a look in the mirror And that's, you know, when I notice that I have a big smudge or like a really weird eyebrow hair that's just longer than it ought to be or or something. And the general reason you look in the mirror is it's kind of like your fine, like correction, right? Is there something that I need to work on, right? If you're you're a lady, maybe, you know, your makeup looks funky and you didn't know and you just kind of, oh, nope, like I got to, you fix that. You find that zit you didn't know you had until you're about to walk out the door. Right? Whatever, whatever it is, we look in the mirror to see ourselves for who we actually are in that moment and to see what we might need to address. Right? Maybe you look in the mirror and you go, I've been paying for the gym for three years. Maybe I should go. Right? I know that's me. You can talk to my wife. That's actually me. Um, why do I pay for a gym? When we go home this afternoon, she's going to tell me to cancel my gym membership. Right? <laughs> but... But that's the point. Like, it's, it's like a man who looks in the mirror and then just moves on and forgets what he looks like. Right? When we hear the word, we hear all of the things that God promises. We hear all of the commands that he gives us. We hear all of the things that we should do. Right? This is a, a, a book that tells us who God is, how he saved us, the greatest news ever, and then what we ought to do with it. And if we just take it and then move on, we're like that person who just kind of forgets their own face in the mirror. He sees who he is, but he doesn't adjust or change or do anything about it. This is, I think, this this last part of of James chapter 1 is one of the most important passages of Scripture for the church of our time today and of all times and all days. I think the church, including in many ways our own, we're not exempt from this, but I'm not harping specifically on Stoprez. I'm generally ranting against the church. I think we're really, really great at being hearers of the word. Especially Presbyterians. Presbyterians are star players at hearing the word, of thinking about what it says, of studying it in its original languages, of digging into Bible studies together, of contemplating how it might shape our lives. But we're generally not the best doers of the word, are we? We like to study the word. We even like to have the word change how we think and feel, right? You might engage in a study of God's word and feel more loved or more safe or more secure or more confident or more joyful or more thankful or even more humbled. But what is the word producing inside of you and I in terms of actual action, right? See, every single week when I preach, I pray beforehand, and, and, and it's, it's, it varies. I, I don't have scripts that I memorize or anything. But every single week when you come here and you have the pastoral prayer, you hear something along the lines of this. May we be different when we leave than when we entered, right? That's not just gibberish that I say because it sounds fancy in Christianese. That's a, that's a good, earnest, prayerful plea that I have every time I step into the pulpit. It's a prayer that whatever is said the word of God is opened and expounded to the people, 
that every single person who comes in, in contact with it, when they leave, they might actually be and do different than when they walked into the door. You should leave today in some way changed, not just rethinking, but actually actively, actionably changed than when you walked in the door today. Something about your Monday should actually be different than the last Monday because you had an encounter with God's word and it convicted you, it shaped you, it spurred you on to something. And most of us go, yeah, I really ought to do that. And then you go to lunch. And there's a few things more comatose, more coma-inducing than a Sunday after church lunch, Right? I don't know about you, Sunday afternoon is when I am my most tired when I get home, probably because I've spent the morning just pouring it all out, right? It's the last time I want to think about change, but then Monday comes, and it's just like the, the week, and then we have to take care of X, Y, Z, and it's a new week and a new day, and we just move on. And in God's power, when I step up here, I pray that every one of us actually does different each week because God's Word has shaped us. You want to know something? I think... I think Satan gets really excited about most churches on Sunday mornings. I think, I think Satan loves to see a bunch of churches packed in. I think he, he really enjoys watching every seat be filled with churches each week, people listening to preaching and then moving on with their life. I think he actually likes that more than when people don't go to church at all sometimes. Because if they don't go to church at all, there's at least the potential for some kind of a guilt. But, well, you've come here and you've done your job, so when you go home, you can feel like you've done the Christian thing. And so it's actually even, even more likely that you get so numb to just being an attender and an absorber and a, and a thinker of Scripture and not a doer that you, you kind of become paralyzed. You just come in this, this you come because it's what you do. And then you walk out the door. I think the enemy loves Churches that fill every Sunday, hear the word of God preached and proclaimed, and then have the people go out and go to lunch and nothing changes. I think that's joy-inducing for the enemy. I really, I really do. I think he loves it even more than if some of us didn't even come at all. Because at least we'd feel the weight of the guilt of not being in the Lord's presence each Sunday morning. Right? Instead of feeling absolved by doing the bare minimum of showing up listening to the weird bald guy talk and sing, or not sing at the beginning. Yeah. Imagine if you, if that was different. What, what if you ensured that you actually get to a point where you do something that God says? Imagine if you lived the, the way that I'm talking about at work. What if you went to work and your boss had a list of things to do and on Friday after the week is over, he came to you and said, hey, did you finish? He said, no, I, I read all your emails, though. Like, I, I, man, I really, I really thought about some of the things that you were telling me to do. And, and actually, I was trying to think of, like, how would you have me do it if I was going to do it? <laughs> and so I, I went, I went to, to people that used to work here, and I, and I talked to them about the way that you li liked to have things done before so that I could actually get like a real set. That took me like all of Monday and Tuesday. And then I figured out how, how you might want to have this done, and then I was studying. And then I put together an action plan of how I might do it, you know, like a step-by-step. -step. Uh, but d did you actually do anything? Well, no, but, you know, I... How many of you would last a week in your jobs if you didn't actually do, but just thought? But yet somehow we get to the Christian life and we think that that's the way that we can go about our day. And I'll tell you something, James has zero time for that. And to be clear, before we move on, here's what James is not saying. James is not saying that our doing is earning us salvation. Right? That that's what earns us salvation. It's not by anything we do, the fact that we are saved is a gift of the Lord to us, given freely by the, the grace of God. And we'll actually dig into that a little deeper when we get to, to James chapter 3, when he actually talks about the direct correlation of, of faith and works. We'll get into that theological uh, masterpiece when the, the time comes. But James is saying that a life given to Christ will show some action signs if it's in any way real. If, you, if your faith is actually genuine, 
There will be an outpouring of, of action that comes to it. He's saying you cannot encounter the gospel for all it really is. You can't see Jesus for who he really is and not be moved to action by it. It's just not possible. It's not how the gospel works. If you encounter Jesus and he shapes you and he changes you and you see him for who he is, you will move and you will act and you will do differently. That's just the nature of the gospel. James is saying that a life given to Christ will actually show in the things that you do week in and week out. That every week you come to church, you'll be changed. There's people in your life during the week that should notice something about you and go, well, why are you doing that differently? You didn't do that last week. Well, I just was shaped. I was reading God's word and he convicted me and so I stopped doing X and I started doing Y. I got off the couch and I instead spent my Tuesdays doing this now and I don't have time for that anymore because like, your, your life should be reshuffled every week in some way, small, large, whatever the convicting of that week is, right? Just over a week ago, our, our session met and, and made some decisions for some, of the, some new initiatives that we're going to take as a church, and you'll learn more about those in the months ahead. But I was very proud to be in the room that day. We had a, a session that said, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to do. We're going we're gonna to stop being hearers in this community and in this town, and we're going to start doing in some big ways. I want you to pray for the leadership of this church over the next two to three months as we put some of that together into more concrete forms. But there, there's, there's some, some cool stuff coming down the pike here because we have a session that just said that, that heated this. And we never even talked about this before we got there, um, providentially maybe. But, but there, there, there's some ways in which this church is going to move, right? Because James clearly calls us to be doers, to do something. If most of your faith life involves attending, reading, studying, thinking, it might be time to seriously reevaluate your life. This is a hard message to hear. This is the kind of thing that might anger some people. There might be some of you that might not show up for a week or two after this one. That's okay. We love you. And no, this isn't preached to you directly. Right? I promise you this. But it might be time to reevaluate. Where in your week is your faith thoroughly, actively doing something? whether that's serving in your own church here or out in daily life, how are you being impacted by the way that you encounter the truth of God's word? James ends us by pointing to a concrete example. He tells us what pure and undefiled religion is. Right? He says to care for orphans and widows in their distress. It's not meant to be an exhaustive thing. He's not saying like the only thing anyone here ought to do, right? when I say be doers of the word, Care for the widows, care for the orphans, nothing else. Right? That's not what he's trying to say. It's not, that's not the sum total of all good religion. But it's an example. He's saying, look, if you, if you guys don't understand what I'm trying to say to you and you, you need an example of what doing looks like, it doesn't look like attend another Bible study. Go find some orphans. Go find some widows. Go care for them. Right? If James was writing this today, he might say something along the lines of, do you want to know what it looks like to be doers? <sighs> Go down to Rahab and pray with somebody. Bring them a meal. Right? Don't pass by the, the homeless guy, but invite him to, to McDonald's and buy him a number two. And ask him about his life. Right? Adopt a neighbor. Not literally, although maybe literally. Right? But adopt a neighbor who you know just is alone. Maybe you have a single mom that lives down the road. Watch her kids for free. Once a week. Tell her to go get her nails done or a massage or something to give her some rest. Right? James is saying, look, here's some examples. Just, just go, and, go and actually do something that, that might just demonstrate that the things that you're reading and studying and hearing actually are having a shaping impact on the life that you're, that you're living. Find something, anything. And caring for the, the least of these at that time, that was orphans and widows, because if you were a widow, especially a female widow, you were destitute because everything relied on, on the male at that time, right? You, were, you had nothing, right? So, so let's, let's start by looking at the most needy around us and, and, and doing something. 
If you want to be active in your faith, find a need that those around us have. Big, small, whatever. And, and, and meet that need. Selflessly meet that need. Without expecting anything in return. Right? Ask yourself that as a person. How can you love those around you without expecting anything in return? As a church, we ought to ask yourself that. Every single day, how can we meet needs in this community without expecting anything in return? And if, if, if the result of meeting someone's need is that they don't come to church and, and worship here, are we still meeting, are going to keep doing that? Or are we going to say, well, that didn't work? Right? What does it mean to bear fruit? Actively look to meet the needs of people around us. Actively shape the way your, your calendar is set up based on the way that Scripture convicts you of God's truth. If you're buying into the lies of the enemy and you can just sense it, get into the Word of God with a, by yourself or with a, a friend or in a Bible study with a bunch of friends. But when you get in that Bible study, every single time, if you're part of a Bible study right now, a, a part of your conversation as you study God's Word should always be, all right, well, what can we do as a result of what we've learned today? Like on Wednesday. If you're in a Tuesday night study, what can I do tomorrow based on what I just read? Like actual, an actionable change, however small, that I could make based on what I've just studied. Right? That ought to be part of the conversation that we're in. One final thought. I, I said from the beginning that James's theme here was all about deception, right? His primary concern is that we don't allow ourselves to be deceived by the enemy. And I think, I think the commands to hear and do the word are James's way of ensuring that we don't fall to the deception of the enemy, right? I think when we truly follow God's word into action, when we're focused on doing what he says, when we get busy in that kind of a life, it makes bearing up under the weight of trials and temptations so much easier. Because we're living in the truth. I say this all the time, but that's why mission trips are so fulfilling. You're just, you're just doing what he says. I mean, if you've ever been and served on a, on a mission trip, it seems like trials and temptations just kind of take a break when you're on them, right? Why? Because you're serving and you're doing what the word says. And you're so busy doing that that you don't even remember the temptations and trials that you were facing. It makes falling into temptation so much easier to avoid. You're just busy doing the word of God. And see, for James who seems to be scatterbrained, this whole chapter connects together. All the things that he talks about are about avoiding the deception of the enemy. And the way you do it is you just you hear the word and you do what it says. And you just focus on that. And the trials and the temptations and all the things that get in the way, a lot of those will just start to kind of fade into the background. I don't know about you, but for me, temptation comes in the quiet moments when I'm not doing when I'm allowing my, my head to be in charge and to just churn and do the thinking. How many of you have a lot of trouble falling asleep at night? Because when you finally start to turn everything off and your mind gets to go, it just goes a thousand miles an hour into all the anxiety riddled directions that it possibly could go, right? And you allow your truth, the lies of the enemy to just invade, right? James says that the antidote to that is doing. Get out there, look at God's word, do what it says, all right? And so the challenge is very simple to you today. Are you mostly a hearer of the word or a student of it? Are you a doer? In the last month, what have you actually done based on what the word of God has taught you? What's one actionable thing about your life that has changed, right? Not what have you attended, not what have you studied, not what have you contemplated or thought, but what have you done and ask him if the answer to that is nothing seek him this week and ask him to point you in the direction of something to do i would amend the phrase god gave you one mouth and two ears but he also gave you two feet and ten fingers because you ought to listen more than you speak but you ought to do more than you do any of those things let's pray lord thank you
Thank you for commands even when they are so hard. Lord, all of us succumb and fall to the temptation to to hear what you have to say, to examine it, to study it, to relish in it, to even enjoy it, to let it shape our thinking, but not our hands and our feet. So oftentimes for us, those are the last two things that you change and move because we're stubborn. We like our life the way it is. We like the things that we don't want to change. We don't want to do because doing can be scary. We could do and fail. So Lord, we pray that you would give us not just your word that commands us to do, but your power that enables us to do. And your spirit and your guidance, which enables us to do the right things, not just something blindly. We praise you for the convicting words that James offers to not just his people in a, in a town that causes them to want to lose all hope and faith, but in our lives as well, where we feel tempted to lose hope and to turn our gaze away from you. Lord, we pray that this week you would convict every single one of us to do something, to change something, to move in some way based on what your word convicts us of. That we would come back next week to share stories and testimonies out in the lobby before and after worship. That the worship of your people next week wouldn't just even be in this room, but outside of there as well as we continue to to, to testify to the ways that you've been at work through our hands and our feet, not just our mouth and our mind. Be with us. We love you and we praise you. And all his people said, Amen. Amen.